Commitments through real estate investing and house hacking. With me are some people who know a little bit about real estate. Um, our panel today will cover the power of real estate investing and how it pertains to financial independence. Real estate and the power of leverage offers one of the fastest paths to financial independence. Um, some uh, schmuck named Andrew Carnegie said, 90% of all millionaires become so through owning real estate. More money has been made in real estate than in all industrial investments combined. More money has been made in real estate than in all industrial investments combined. The wise young man or wage earner or woman, Andrew, of today <laughs> invests his or her money in real estate. Obviously, I added some things for him <laughs> that he just didn't know. Uh, rental properties can provide passive income, and you can even live for free by house hacking, a concept where you buy a property that has more space than you need. You live in the parts that you need, and you rent out the extras. Some cases, your rental income covers your entire mortgage or more, so you're essentially getting paid to live for free. Our panelists today have a variety of experiences with real estate and fall in different spots on the financial independence journey. Right next to me is Scott Trench. Scott Trench is the youngest president of Bigger Pockets. He, he's the youngest president in the history of Bigger Pockets, although not the youngest looking. For those of you who know Josh Dorkin, you know that he looks like he's nine. <laughs> Scott can easily pass for 12. Um, and I mentioned that Scott's the president of this multi-million dollar company, not to brag, but to illustrate the fact that he still chooses frugality and real estate to generate his wealth. Sitting next to him is Chad Carson. Chad Carson is an unemployed bum who has never worked a day in his life. <laughs> He's never had a traditional job because he discovered the power of real estate investing right after college, right after he graduated. So he doesn't need to work. His, pass his income is generated. He what? I do, he doesn't I need do to work. work. <laughs> He's an unemployed bum. He's really never do. worked a day in his life. <laughs> his real estate investments generate enough passive-ish income that he doesn't have to work for anybody else. Gwen is the co-host of the Fire Drill podcast. She runs the Fiery Millennials blog and used real estate to generate enough passive income to leave her cushy job at John Deere and join Chad as an unemployed bot. <laughs> that was her plan. Uh, not all plans go the way that you want them to. So Gwen is going to tell us about her experiences in real estate. Drew from Guy on Fire defended my good name when Robert Kiyosaki called me a loser for wanting to retire early. So I guess we're all losers, and I'm okay with that. I think he was just trying to capitalize on an article about my family that went viral. <laughs> Drew is not an unemployed bum. He works as a commercial lender, giving people big bags of money when they want to invest in real estate themselves. He noticed that all these rich guys have the same thing in common. They own lots of real estate. So he started buying up hideous yet livable properties in Washington, D.C. to build up his portfolio that he can also kick his job to the curb. Uh, Scott, do you want to talk about what your portfolio looks like right now? Uh, sure. So I have eight units in my portfolio, two duplexes and a quadplex, uh, all in the city limits of Denver. Um, they're all 1950s builds, all between 700, 500 and 700 square feet, one bed or two bed. Uh, very simple, straightforward properties, and I'm planning to buy another one this year with pretty straightforward approach, 25% down um, for a two, three, or four unit property uh, as opportunity permits. Chad, do you own any real estate? Sure. Um, I live in Clemson, South Carolina. That's where my investments are. And we have about 90 units. So most of those are smaller, uh, multifamily, some single family houses. And, but we've accumulated those over about 16 years. And sometimes we sell off some of those, buy some other ones. But um, we're kind of at a stable point with our portfolio. And I mainly have other people managing those for me. So some third party managers, also kind of an in-house manager that I've trained to do a lot of the day-to-day -day property management. So happy to talk about some of that today as well. Gwen? So I was investing in Eastern Iowa and uh, I had a triplex that nearly met the 2% rule. It was an excellent deal. 
but um, I am not a very good landlord, as it turns out. So now I own actually no properties whatsoever, and I consider myself very blessed. <laughs> <laughs> and I live in Washington, D.C., and have four properties, which is seven total units. That's two single-family homes, a duplex, and a triplex. And I self-manage my properties. So all of these people here have or had rental properties where they were the landlord. Um, this is one of the most common ways to invest in real estate, but there are other ways as well. My main real estate investment is called the live-in flip. I buy a very unattractive house, but it's still habitable. So it's not a meth house, it doesn't have mold. Um, <laughs> those exist, those are, that's, that's actually a really good investment if you can clean up the meth. Um, so I move in. And I rehab the house. I live in the construction zone for two years. When I get ready to sell it, I've lived there for two years, I can write off, uh, avoid capital gains up to $500,000 because I am married. Um, so that can be another really powerful way to invest in real estate. I have also participated in syndication deals where somebody, um, let's say Scott wants to buy a property, a, like a bigger property, he doesn't have enough money, he gets a bunch of people together, we pool our money and buy it that way. Um, with the intention to sell it quickly, it's typically a value add, so it's kind of a rundown property in a good area. You make it look beautiful and then you sell it to somebody else who doesn't want to do all of that work. Mm -hmm. um, and I have also participated in private lending where I'm the bank, or my 401k is the bank. Um, so Scott, what is your ideal investment? Uh, well, so my ideal, so my approach is basically dollar cost averaging over a period of seven to ten years. So I buy one property every twelve to eighteen months, with the idea being that sometimes I'll buy near the peak of the cycle, sometimes I'll buy at the bottom of the cycle. Um, so my ideal investment property is a slightly larger property than the one I bought before, that is bring that allows me to bring a meaningful amount of investable cash to the investment, and that I believe will cash flow through good times and bad. I want to win. Um, I'm, I am not, for example, uh, building a real estate business. I am investing in real estate on the side while working full time. So I'm looking for a, a solid single or double if I can get it for property, not a home run, um, that will allow me to win if the market goes up, win if the market goes down, and win if the market uh, stays <coughs> sideways, winning, by, uh, winning in a downturn by maintaining a conservative overall portfolio that cash flows um, in most probable environments. So. 1950s duplex, triplex, or quad <laughs> is my ideal investment property. <laughs> Chad, what do you look for? Um, so it's kind of changed over time. When I first started as an investor, I was very much in the business of investing. So I would go find fixer-upper properties at a really low price and then either like flip the, the houses, so buy, sell them quickly. And what I was looking for then was much different than I am now because currently my ideal property is, a, is an income property. And I sort of look at it from like two different angles. One is very much quantitative in the numbers. And so I want to ensure there's a, uh, a reasonable rent to price ratio. And so that the amount of, after I pay all my expenses, it's almost thinking about like a dividend stock or like a CD in the bank. If I invest my money in this, this asset, I want to get a certain amount of re return income wise um, from that property. So it's very simple in some ways there. But the, the other part of the equation is, is, is not even is not quantitative. It's more like the qualitative parts of the property. So I'm looking for a property that will attract the best tenants possible, who will want to stay for as long as possible. So in the, in the real estate world, we sort of think about neighborhoods as a kind of roughly like A, B, C, D kind of ranking, where A would be like your prime real estate in the best area in a town, downtown. And it's really difficult, but we get the quantitative part of the equation for small investors like me, at least, um, to work in the A neighborhoods. But I sort of find my sweet spot is in you know, B, B minus, perhaps C, and then sometimes turning a C property into a B over time where there's kind of path of progress. Um, I try to avoid D properties. I've, I've been there and kind of have the burn marks to, to kind of <laughs> to scars to prove it. Um, but I find those are a little bit harder to kind of get to this passive state where you have either you're self-managing and not having to do a whole lot of work or you have a third-party manager. It's very difficult to make, for me to manage some of the more intensive properties at the, at the lower, lower, lower price ranges. So I, I try to find kind of a, a medium, medium there where it's qualitative is really nice, but it's also um, a good, good return on investment. You mentioned that you don't want people to leave. You want them to stay for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why don't you want to just meet new people all the time? 
Well, <laughs> so uh, you can think about it kind of like on one end of the spectrum, like an Airbnb or a hotel. You have people moving in and out every day. And you think about a hotel room. When you leave this weekend, you have the towels all over the floor. You have all this thing, these things to clean up. Well, it's the same with a rental property. Every time somebody leaves, that's when your highest expenses come to bear. You have to paint the walls typically. The new, the new tenant is not going to want to have a, you know, walls that aren't painted and carpets not cleaned. And so at a minimum, you're, you know, I've spent a thousand bucks just on a turnover on any size unit. And so if you can have somebody stay for 10 years, then they're not going to be asking you to paint the walls necessarily. They're going to be happy with their carpet. And so I found the most efficient rentals are where people stay the longest. That being said, my niche um, on a lot of my properties right now are college student rentals who do not stay as long. Um, but I try to find the college student rentals who stay a little bit longer than normal. So like I like grad students who, I love like liberal arts, uh, grad students like an English major who's gonna stay there seven years, like tor <laughs> tormented over their, uh, their PhD and they can't, can't ever get it right. And so I, lo I love liberal arts grad students. <laughs> Gwen, do you want to talk about your ideal investment or? Yeah, my in ideal investment property is one that doesn't have tenants who deal drugs. Um, that's super nice. I focused on the, uh, the first time around, I focused too much on the numbers. And I um, got this really awesome property. It, was, it met the 2% rule. It was um, very cheap. And it turned out that it was cheap for a reason. Um, it was this beautiful 1910 Victorian style house. And it was beautiful. And it had original woodwork. And it was just really, really beautiful. And um, I got really emotionally attached to that house. And you can't do that in real estate at all. Um, so that was a huge problem. And um, my class, as in my, the class of the neighborhood that I moved into is probably like a D minus. Maybe, maybe it could have been an F. Um, I definitely didn't think that it was that bad, but it had a reputation that I was unaware of. And uh, everyone was like, why did you buy in that neighborhood? Nobody wants to live there. And I was like, it's true. Nobody wanted to live there. So the only people that did live there were people that couldn't live anywhere else. The dredges of the tenant's population and... As such, caused a lot of problems. I had lease abandonments and people dealing drugs out of the property. And so um, my ideal investment is a box that has a roof on it with a couple of rooms that's nice and easy, preferably a slab, and um, has is a nice neighborhood. So I'll, I'm going back into real estate at some point. I'm, I'm not too burned. I, I have a few scars, but I'll come back. Um, but uh, it would be... The, I would buy the worst house in the best neighborhood I could possibly find and then make it look nice and, instead of buying the best house in the absolute worst neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the 2% rule a couple of times. Can you explain that really quickly? Yeah, so rule of thumb when looking for properties is the 1% rule. So you should get 1% of your um, purchase price in rent per month. So if you have a property that costs $100,000, you should be looking to get $1,000 a month in rent at the very least per month. So for um, real numbers, I bought my property for 825, so I needed to get at least 825 dollars a month in rent to make that scenario work. But since it was a triplex, uh, there were three units, and I got almost 1600 dollars a month in rent if my tenants had ever paid on time <laughs> and not gone foregone on the rent and I had to kick them out. Drew, what is your ideal investment? So originally my ideal investment. Uh, I started off with house hacking, so I wanted to find a way to reduce my living expenses and also find a way where I could actually live for free or get paid to live. Uh, since then, I've uh, pivoted a bit, and I invest in ugly homes in D.C., uh, so properties that have good bones but need a lot of cosmetic work, and I tend to look in kind of the C-plus, B-minus neighborhoods where there's signs that the neighborhood is improving, where people are renovating properties or businesses are opening up, and there's a lot of demand drivers for people to be in these areas. Um, I find that between the renovation or the value-add process and the demand drivers in the neighborhood, it creates a good uh, balance of value and cash flow. Do you invest in solely in real estate or in other vehicles like stocks or bonds? Why or why not? I'm just going to open that up to all of you. I, I invest in uh, a whole bunch of different things. So I have uh, real I, I have my real estate properties. I've got uh, retirement accounts. I've got a after-tax stock portfolio. Um, I have a 
a cash position that I, I have uh, in order to pursue uh, different opportunities. Um, I wrote a book and I joined a startup. So I've got a portfolio across a number of different assets. And I think that that's uh, fairly typical across um, users, users of bigger pockets, for example. I'm not sure about the four people up here, though. I'm, pr I'm probably not quite as, um, and I, don't, I do have stocks, I do have you know, equity investments. Typically, mine are in my retirement account, though. And I, I very much, I was very concentrated in real estate early on. And I, I look at real estate as a startup when you're first beginning, particularly as you, I was 23 years old and jumped into real estate investing right out of college. And I used a lot of leverage as well. So I was in like pure startup mode and had most of my assets, which were not big at the time, in real estate. But over time, my idea is to diversify that more. And, um, you know, in, Equities are, seem a little overvalued for me, so I'm not as excited about jumping into a lot of them at the moment, but I do dollar cost average into the index funds and continue investing over time in my retirement account. And also, but, um, I also have a book now as well. I didn't think about that as an asset, but it is. <laughs> and, um, and so I'm, I'm interested in other types of investments, even within real estate. So I have rental properties, but I'm more interested at this point in future investments will typically be loans to other people, potentially syndications, uh, more passive investments where I'm not the landlord or I'm the person having to manage the property. Uh, nearly all of my money is invested in the stock market in various vehicles. Um, the vast majority of it is in my retirement accounts, in my 401k. Um, I also have, also have a Roth IRA and I did have a taxable investment account before I emptied that bad boy out. Oh, yeah. So I was using real estate as like a way to diversify all of my investments. So that's why I want to get back into it is because I feel like I'm a little bit too much invested in the market right now. And I'm overweight real estate, but I also invest in dividend stocks and index funds and uh, gold and silver coins. I, I was going to mention, I also have a pretty big position of cash, which I think is important in real estate because one of the, the downsides of real estate, which I actually think would be an upside, but is, is you can't sell it quickly. So it's a liquid, and you also have ups and downs of cash flow. So I maintain a, a, a bigger cash position than I think people would with a, a pure equity uh, portfolio where you can liquidate them quickly. And during the 2007-8 downturn, that was actually a really smart move that I didn't realize was so smart, just because I had, to, I had a lot of vacancies and things kind of came up, came up during that time that where cash was a very helpful asset to complement your, your real estate. <clears throat> okay, this next one's a two-parter. How Do you self-manage or do you have a property manager, and how much time do you spend actively managing your rentals uh, weekly? So I, I self-manage my properties. Uh, my properties are in a little bit nicer neighborhoods. Um, but the average rent for my units is above 1000 or $1,200. So for me, um, and my tenants have stick, largely stuck around for at least one year. I've actually had only one ter tenant um, leave after a year, and that's because they did a really good job and are buying a house now. So mm -hmm. great on them. Um, so I, I, I view the, you know, how, how long do I manage these properties for? Maybe around an hour or two a month at most. So with, you know, eight grand in net cash flow per month, um, if I were to rent that out or have that outsourced to a property manager, I view that as about an $800 an hour activity that I'm outsourcing. So that's how I'm kind of looking at the self-management for now. As I get more units uh, and there's more work involved, I suspect that that will, that number, those numbers will change. And I plan to begin hiring a property manager whenever that doesn't make any, any sense uh, for me anymore. Uh, I self-managed my property because I lived next door. And so I was in and around that all the time. And an hour or two a month would be a dream because I was spending like an hour or two a day. Um, especially when I quit my job and moved six hours away, I hired a property manager. And uh, I then ended up having to spend time managing both the tenants and the property manager. And so I doubled the work. And it didn't make any sense at all that I was paying somebody to double my work. Um, so it was just a not great situation all around. So I find that uh, I typically spend one to two hours a month per property and I have four properties so uh, you know it's usually less than 10 hours a month and sometimes it's significantly less than that. So I have, I have a couple different uh, management arrangements so as I mentioned earlier I had 90 units and so we I had a kind of key person that I trained to do a lot of the 
management for me. She was a bookkeeper for me, just starting off and checking mail. And over time, she grew into a. She showed, proved proved that she could handle that and kind of took on more roles. So, we she basically handles about 95 percent of the property management activities for us, like tenant turnover, handling customer service calls, maintenance calls, that sort of thing for us. And she does, she handles about 60 units. And then I have a we, we acquired more units and kind of outgrew her capacity. And so we hired a third-party management company um, to handle the rest of that. So they, they handle all of it, and we just pay a 10% fee to them. But I, I would say the amount of time, I, have, I actually tracked this pretty closely. I was in Ecuador for 17 months with my family in 2017 and 18, and part of that was an experiment to see can we produce income and me do it from abroad and how much time would I spend. And it was typically an hour or two per week um, is my role. And t typically what I did with my 60 units, I still paid the – the bills for my contractors. So like if a handyman came and fixed something that week, I wasn't taking the call and like sending them out there usually, but I would, I still wanted to see the money. And so our bookkeeper would send the bills. We have a property management software. They would upload that to the property management software. I would go to online banking, pay the bill and just kind of handle it that way just so I can see what's going on. So I, I like to be, I don't ever see myself not being involved in the bookkeeping and the, the money. I've just heard that's a good idea to always kind of keep your pulse on that when you outsource things to other people. But from a, with a third party manager, I spend even less time. Just, I just look at a report every month and I probably spend you know, 20, 30 minutes for those 30 units. And I, I want to chime in one more thing so that I'm not misleading with uh, that one to two hours a month. When I buy these properties, I put in a lot of work to stabilize them. Nobody's selling a perfectly running, well-kept, great, tenant, great tenanted property at a low price. So if I'm going to get a good deal, I'm going to put in some work up front. And I've also absorbed a tremendous amount of real estate investing educational content through books, podcasts, all that kind of stuff, the amount of which is probably hundreds and hundreds of hours in my free time while traveling or working out um, or doing like chores around the house. So uh, adding in those hours, that's probably leading to why my yeah. actual work on managing properties is maybe in that lower range. So I, I agree, and I also spend a lot more time up front on my properties too, where to the point where it's, it's I mean, very lopsided on the on the front. You're spending a, it's a startup part time, full time job in some cases up front, and then over time, this is 10, 15 years later for me. Yeah, I would definitely say you either put in the work up front when it's easier and less traumatic, or you put in the work on the other end when it's stressful and very expensive. So put in the work up front, do your due diligence beforehand, and things go much better. Yeah, I found it's a lot like a startup. Um, with my properties, I go for the value add space, and I typically buy my buildings vacant and, you know, fixing everything up front, brand new water heaters, uh, and replacing uh, a bunch of items up front saves you a lot of headaches down the road. Uh, so once it's up and running, it's just a nice annuity stream most months. Uh, so real estate is not all rainbows and unicorns. Let's look at some things that happen when, when things don't go right. What has been your biggest challenge as an investor? <laughs> Um, doing background checks. I really, really, really hate that. I think it's invasive, but you have to do it. You have to know what their credit looks like. You have to know what their eviction history looks like. And uh, if you don't do that, then you're just going to get taken for a ride by the people who know the system better than you. And it's not going to go well. So, um, yeah, I would definitely say that. That's why my shirt says dividends don't buy, dividends don't sell drugs. Um, because... <laughs> Uh, we coined that phrase on my podcast because um, my my income stream from VTSAX has never caused me any problems. I've never had to talk to the cops about my VTSAX account. Um, but I've definitely had to talk to the cops about the shooting that happened in my backyard. So I, I would go back to the original when the criteria I look for properties. Like the biggest mistakes I've made and the biggest headaches I've had have been bad properties or bad the, the locations were wrong or we didn't fix up the property the right way, so it attracted a person who was willing to live in that type of property or that type of location. And it's nothing to say that those were bad people. Like it was just, there was, there just tend to be more drama. And there was, and I think there's, there's different niches within real estate. Some people do very well renting low income properties. And so it's like, I think that's a good niche as well. I, in fact, I have a friend who does that in, in some in Baltimore, some in other places, and, and does very well. So it's just knowing your temperament and what you can, you can work with. But for me, 
like not knowing what you're, uh, we were investing in the, in the location we weren't prepared for, and we had tenants who had a lot more turnover, a lot more drama, and so those caused more problems for us. And the other thing we didn't do correctly early on was doing tenant screenings. I, I think if there were one thing you, as a new landlord you could take away is have, have objective criteria, like written criteria, because that's actually the, the right thing to do legally as well. You need, you need to do that but it's also the right business decision to make so that you're not making emotional decisions or you're making judgment calls based on your tenant. You need to actually have criteria like credit. Uh, they have landlord references, they make enough income, and they have a ratio of income to the rent. Um, these objective criteria are almost like a underwriting a loan. Like when you go get borrow money, your lender is actually asking you to do all these things. And so you as a landlord should require the same thing or you should require your property manager to do that. And that's one of the first things I screen my property managers on is to say like, what is your tenant screening criteria? What's your process? How do you do that? And we discuss that and you can actually give them your criteria. Like even if they said 600 is my minimum credit score, typically you could say, no, I like 650 or you could tell them and you can discuss the criteria. And that's one of the most important uh, decisions you make. Um, my, I had it drilled into my head very early by doing those hundreds of hours of research before kind of getting into this, that a credit score alongside all these other tenant sc uh, screening criteria though, the te credit score may be the single most important factor in avoiding problems. I, I'm sure that there are good ten tenants that have great credit scores that are cause problems, but I have not anecdotally come across them, whereas every single story that I've ever heard about a bad tenant starts with, or when I ask the question, did they have a good credit score? Uh, it turns out they did not. Did your tenant have a good credit score? I'm not even sure my tenants knew what a credit score was. Usually I got paid in a white paper bag full of cash. So, so my, my, uh, yeah, my theory stands for at least one more story uh, here at this panel. Uh, the well maybe, goes deep, folks. Yeah. There's lots of stories there. So, one, one area where you can't control for tenant scores, or at least that I didn't, I probably could have, uh, was in an in I inherited tenant. I bought a property that had tenants already in it, and so I have uh, some problems with the tenant that uh, came with a property that I purchased um, that I didn't go through my process to screen them and, and place them. <clears throat> I found cutting corners uh, typically was one of the bigger mistakes, uh, whether it's with screening tenants or taking care of a repair or renovation, spending the additional extra time up front will save you significant time on the back end. Uh, so spending the extra 15 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour to screen a tenant and call for landlord references and do the credit check may save you nightmares from having a professional tenant that will squat in your building or not pay their rent. Uh, likewise, with a repair or renovation, uh, making sure that the work is done properly, uh, taking the extra couple days or weeks to get the property uh, in a good position uh, will save you time down the road to where you don't have a problem that's perpetually going on. You said professional tenant, and I bet everybody here is going to do rental real estate, or most everybody is, is interested in that. Can you explain what a professional tenant is? That is not somebody who has a professional job. <laughs> or maybe that is their job. I think they would consider it a job. Um, so professional tenants, uh, from a landlord standpoint, is one of the biggest nightmares out there. Uh, these are people that uh, know how to game the system. They know the local landlord-tenant laws, and they know where they can pick their battles and cause you a ton of headaches and nightmares. Uh, they will uh, find a way to get an apartment or a house, and then they will stop paying their rent and they know that they can get away with that with the local laws and they won't pay their rent for maybe six months at a time and meanwhile you're filing with the courts and uh, going through the eviction process and uh, now you're stuck with a property that has a mortgage with no cash flow. And they know how to game the system so they can extend that eviction. You can't go in and just take them out of the property. You have to wait until the government gets them out, the local laws. Um, okay, well, so and I just want to add really fast. So also they're very manipulative. I had this one guy who was like a perfect angel whenever he spoke to me or anybody that had the power over him, um, and then was like a completely different person, throwing parties at two o'clock in the morning, with you know double fisting glass bottles as they held an impromptu rap concert on top of a bronco, like. 
I was getting these reports and I couldn't understand the difference between the two guys because I, oh, I spoke to him. He's always very nice, very polite, well-spoken. And then here he is affiliated with the local gang on the side. Like, who knew? Your landlord, your tenant is not going to come into your property and, and say, hey, I'd like to rent from you. I'm not going to pay you rent after month two and I'm going to throw diapers in your backyard in the winter time. Um, they don't tell you that up front. Okay, so we were talking before this started, and we are all pretty well known as real estate people, and we've had a lot of people coming up to us throughout the week and asking us questions. So I'm going to ask you guys each, if someone came up to you and said, how do I get started investing in real estate? How did you get started? What would you say? What's your number one piece of advice for people? Go. I'm going to take house acting, <clears throat> take house acting before all these other people do. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, my soapbox is, is, house, is something called house hacking, which we've talked about a little bit here. Um, I, I think turning your residence, if you're willing and able to do this, um, into an investment or a quasi-investment is the easiest transition into the business or the kind of more full-time um, approach to real estate investing. And ba there's, a, there's several different ways to do this. You, the the kind of cookie cutter way is you move into a duplex, like we've kind of talked about up here, and you live in one side, you run out the other side. In my case, I lived in a fourplex unit building, so it had one roof, one building with four doors, and I lived in apartment number two, and then the other three units were rented out, and I actually had about a positive 100 bucks per month um, living situation, paying all my expenses, my taxes, my insurance. Uh, they're not all that good, but that's, that's possible, and I, I, I feel like, particularly now with uh, prices very high, and if you're living in a high, high cost of living area, if you're willing to do that, uh, you can reduce your housing expense right off the top, maybe 25%, 50%. And, but then the other nice part is once you're done living there, you've got the property in place, hopefully, you know, in terms of maintenance and you know what the property is, you get your mortgage in place, you can transition out, move out. You don't have to do that forever. And now you have a rental unit that's ready, available, you can, and, and it, turns, it transitions nicely into an investment. So I think that kind of general type of investment is I, I talk to a lot of people who've gotten started in real estate that way, and if, um, you know, often in your 20s and 30s is when that happens, but I know people in their 50s and 60s who've kind of downsized to some situation like that. Maybe with, instead of a duplex, they have a house with a basement apartment or a garage apartment, you know, some of those kind of arrangements. So I, I think that's the number one way I, I see people get started. <clears throat> I would say find a rundown property in the great section of town buy that up and live in it and fix it, I think that would be a good way because then you know the inside and you know the house inside and out and you know how to fix things or you know how to hire good contractors who uh, know how to fix things and you really get familiar with the entire process so that way when you're ready you can just move out and do go on to the next one and I would advise keeping them and moving out instead of selling it and then going in so that way you're just building up this gradual portfolio of, of uh, good houses and good neighborhoods. Uh, I'll uh, shamelessly plug bigger pockets. Um, I think that the thing that helped me the most was watching what other people like me, near me, were doing uh, in order to buy real estate. So I could go, I went on there and I could see, hey, this person's also buying their first property. Um, here's, here's their story and how they're buying that property. Um, and that enabled me to kind of get really comfortable with my first house hack property, my, my first duplex, because I was like, oh, that's very repeatable to my, my circumstance, because um, these deals are so different, and these locations are all so different, and where your comfort zone and financial capacity may, may be, will be very different as well. Yeah, piggybacking on Scott's point, uh, definitely utilize resources like Bigger Pockets, uh, attend local real estate meeting uh, events, find a mentor, and definitely get educated, but also don't be afraid to take action. Most people's first deal is not their best deal, and it's a good way to learn. So. I was going to go back to the previous question about landlord-tenant laws, and that's probably one of the most, every state has different laws on how, how, how your relationship between a landlord and a tenant works, and some states are much more landlord-friendly than, and others are much are more tenant-friendly, and so you should know that going in, <clears throat> because that, it, it could be a wide variety. For example, I'm in South Carolina, which is typically a more tenant, I mean a landlord-friendly state, which just means the landlord-tenant law gives the landlord um, 
a little bit, it makes it easier for them to get the property back in a situation where they're not paying their rent. Uh, I'm not, I don't invest in other states, but my, the repu by reputation, New York, for example, California um, are typically more tenant friendly states, which doesn't mean a, a, a rental won't work there, but it just means you need to understand the process and have an attorney who can help you with that is typically, and who, who can prepare a lease in that state is, is very important um, part of the process. That's part of your due diligence and your homework that I think you would do. And that's, that's why a local real estate meetup or going on bigger packets and going to a local forum where there's other people from your state uh, is really important because getting advice from me on evicting a tenant in South Carolina might be very irrelevant to you wherever you are. And, and by the way, just to, this, is our, this is our advantage over Wall Street. This is why this asset class is accessible to ordinary folks that are investing, you know, with <clears throat> cash that we accumulate and building those portfolios. It's very hard to boil down all of the little things that go on in your area, the little nuances that a local investor friend that you make can teach you about. Um, you can't boil that down into a spreadsheet and compete. Wall Street owns less than one to two percent of uh, single family rentals in this country. So it's all owned by the 87 percent more stats uh, are owned by uh, uh, folks with less than 10 properties um, and the, I guess the rest is by Chad <laughs> <laughs> you know the guy who's an unemployed bum <laughs> I'm sorry Chad do you have a formal job <laughs> uh, yeah I, I've never worked for anybody else that's true so I, I do consider myself a bum that's, that's true <laughs> <laughs> Chad's actually one of the hardest working guys I know he just doesn't have a job um, so I'm going to open it up to questions now because we have been peppered with questions like throughout the week and um, there's nothing going on after this panel in this room so we might go a little bit longer. I saw a question over here first so I'm going to go with her. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Everybody's hand goes down. <laughs> yeah, the, the question, I'm not sure everybody heard that, but the question was her, her situation. She has two properties in D.C. and wants to buy a third property this year but doesn't have the cash to, for the down payment. And I mean, I, I'll just, probably a lot of the panel will agree that it's, it's easier when you do have the cash for the down payment. Um, so that's like the plan A is that. Um, my my situation is a little unique that I got started right out of college and I had about a thousand dollars and in the bank and I didn't have any college debt so I was kind of that's my starting point and also was unemployed and a bum as, as Mindy says so when I walked into a bank to get a loan them looking at me saying hey I'm a real estate investor I'm gonna go flip houses will you give me a loan they were kind of looking at me like oh man this is not this is not the perfect loan because I didn't have steady w2 income and so I had to get a little more creative and so if you don't have the capital, you, you've got to bring something to a transaction. So the capital is one typical investment that you bring to the transaction. But as an entrepreneur, I brought the enthusiasm, the time, the finding the deal to the transaction, the hustle. So if you can do that and partner with somebody else who does have the down payment, that's one way to do it. You can find it, kind of do a joint venture with somebody else. That's kind of, that, so th there's still a down pay payment being made, but it's just not you making it. Um, that's, that's my first suggestion. The other suggestion is getting creative with uh, how you buy the property. Like one, people always assume you have to go out and get a loan and put a down payment on a property. But I've also I've actually had properties where I leased the property from another landlord, for example. And you find it's typically still a landlord who doesn't want the property or is mismanaging it. But I've I've actually gone to a landlord who owned a fourplex building and said, "Could I lease your entire building from you?" And, I, and, and so I control the building basically through a lease and maybe an option to buy the property. So like having a contract to buy it at a certain price. And my option to buy the property might cost me uh, several thousand dollars, maybe 5,000 bucks. But I've now effectively controlled this building using a contract, using something a little bit more creative. It's, it's kind of like stock options and other people might be familiar with some of that, but just applying it to a real asset like real estate 
I could use a very small amount of money to control a property. So that's that's kind of real estate 3.0, you know, 2.0 instead of like you're getting started. But for somebody who's willing to learn that kind of thing, a lease option, it's a way to get into a, a, a building without having a huge down payment. <clears throat> Yeah, I found my property manager through the local real estate group, and uh, he was a young guy. He um, was fairly new to the property management business, but had multiple rental properties that he owned himself, and so he was just adding other people's to his load. And so um, we sat down, we talked about his process. Um, great guy. So I was like, all right, you're in. Also, I had like two days to find a property manager, so... Uh, definitely would recommend having a longer time span to find somebody. How many did you in interview? Uh, just him. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> worked out for him. Do you want to talk about it? Uh, yeah, so that's me, I guess. Um, I, I found there are two different kinds of general third-party managers. There's your kind of smaller mom-and-pop kind of property manager who might manage 50 units or 60 units, something like that. And they are typically, there might be one or two people who just manage all these for you. And it might be like a real estate agent or somebody who, who just looking to make some extra income on the side. And that can be a decent arrangement um, if, if that person has demonstrated their, their trustworthiness and competence. And so like, I, I, just, I, I like to meet the person. I like to network with them. This is, again, the local meetups. The real estate meetups are really important because you can talk to other investors who've mm -hmm use them before. So just like you get references on your tenants and ask for references, you would do the same thing. And I, I look at it a lot like a job interview, um, because if you had an employee and you're bringing on, you would vet them, you would look at their background, you'd ask for uh, other reference from other people. And so whether it's that person, a small, small landlord, small property manager, or a bigger kind of more corporate property manager, both can work. But I think you have to, the same thing, you have to check references on them. You need to ask current customers what their experience is like. And uh, for me, I actually went with the first one I met kind of from the corporate uh, property manager standpoint, but I already had a, an existing relationship with that, that owner of that company and knew them and watched them and observed them from uh, afar for a few years before I actually you know, pulled the trigger and hired them. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I got a question for you, Chad. Is the fact that you did all this and got your hands dirty for so long do you think that gave you power in the relationship that you were in no hurry necessarily to, right. to shift over to a property manager? Yeah, and that's a good point. I, I used to do my property management when I first started. I was self-managed for a long time, and so I knew a lot of the systems and processes that I was going to outsource to this person. And I think that's, that's a big difference is that I, I went in with the idea that I, I knew how property management worked. I at least had studied it. You can study it on bigger pockets. There's a really good book by my friend Brandon Turner on the book on property management, which I think it's kind of a, has a just nice process step by step. So I went to the property management company with the knowledge of how it works instead of just kind of advocating it and saying, please manage this property for me. Mm -hmm. I was discussing how their process worked, what their systems were like, what kind of tenants they look for. And, and, and that was, I think that position of, let, of negotiating is if you are the person who knows nothing, you're obviously in a, like, a little bit more difficult situation. But as a brand new investor, you can study, you can learn, you can become really good at something in a six month period, I found, if you just intensely study it over and over again, listen to every podcast on property management, read every book you can get, go to every forum, you can become really good at it. And then when you go interview your property manager, you're asking intelligent questions and hopefully uh, see some red flags maybe. If, for example, a red flag for me on a property manager would be if, if I asked them a question like this and I said, what is your system and your process for screening tenants? If they say, well, we just get some people coming in and we just make sure it's, a, you know, they, you know, it's kind of like, no, wait a minute, like, tell me, like, I want to see, the right answer would be, well, actually, let me pull out the operations manual, show you my processes, here are the steps, here's what we do, here's a recent tenant that we screen, you know, that's, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for professionalism, just like you would in any other, you know, business. <clears throat> So if you use a loan to buy a property, the bank will require that you have an insurance policy. Uh, if you use another means to finance property, you should also still have an insurance policy. 
And we, with each insurance policy, you'll typically have around $250,000 in liability insurance. Uh, me personally, I own all my properties in my own name and do not use an LLC. However, to further mitigate my risk, I have a $2 million umbrella policy that will protect pretty much anything related to the properties. And you can get that for, um, I want to say it's maybe 10 to 15 bucks a month, so about 200 or what's that, 120 bucks a year. Um, and that is much cheaper than having an LLC. Uh, but with that, it also depends how you are investing. So, uh, Chad, I believe your uh, commercial property is in an LLC. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're going to be doing large commercial properties or having properties with uh, other investors, you'll want to use an LLC and have insurance that way as well. I had a nice big umbrella policy. With the striped shirt. I, oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, I, I just use the same. I'm, I'm the same as you. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Two million dollars in coverage for one hundred and twenty dollars a year sounds like a pretty good deal. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, insurance is is the first line of defense. So I'm I'm with with Drew on that as well. And I think a lot of asset protection I, I see is more of like a two point oh three point oh kind of you know next step after you first begin. And for some people, it's a non-starter because if you go to a, do a house hack or you buy a rental property, you have to have the property in your name to get a loan. And so, you know, getting, putting an LLC is kind of a next step you have to decide to do, and there's some risk, a little bit of risk with, with the loan and the due on sale. There's something called a due on sale clause that if you move the property from your name to an LLC, you know, it, just, it makes it a little more complicated. Um, but I do have my properties in an in a LLC, but it was not uh, the first thing we did. And I, I, I see it, like some people get confused when you say asset protection, like what, what are you trying to protect? When an LLC protects your other assets that you have from your rental property, that's my understanding of it. And so, like, if somebody sues you and wins a big lawsuit against your rental property, you're just trying to make sure your personal stock portfolio and your home and things like that aren't going to get mixed in with all this. That they could still take the property that owns the LLC, the the LLC that owns the property. At least my understanding. And we're, here we are talking to attorney, kind of. Uh, uh, but that's, no legal you know, advice given. Yeah, we're not giving legal advice, but you, know, you would talk Be to your sure attorney. Be sure to consult with your lawyer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for my disclaimers there. But that's, that's why I have an LLC, is to split up my risk and liability. And I have attorneys that I ask to help me with those, those types of things. Um, I think it's important to know where you are in the journey. Like today's topic is financial independence and, and where you're, and so having a purpose, like a bigger purpose for your investing is like how I would answer that because when you're first starting, you might say that I want to acquire five properties or 10 properties. And if this, if you bought one property and put all your money into that one property, if you're willing to take the risk of having mortgages and kind of in, in bar, refinance, it would make sense to refinance as much as possible while still being conservative in terms of cash flow and debt coverage and things like that. So as a growth investor, it makes sense to do that. But as somebody who has already grown enough, and, you're, and I, I kind of think of it as like climbing the mountain, you know, you're getting closer to financial independence or you already have reached there, you know, it, it makes less sense to, to make an extra dollar but add extra risk to your portfolio. So I'm actually in the deleveraging kind of boat myself where every deal I do, I want to put, have less leverage, or maybe I have one property that's free and clear, or another property that's 80% leveraged, but my overall leverage is, is less. So I, I think that's, it just depends on where you are. But in terms of formula, um, wherever you are, you want to make the most income you can for the price you paid, while also having a good qualitative kind of profile of the property. It should be a good location or have potential long run to appreciate, it should attract good tenants. So that, that doesn't change whatever your kind of down payment is, but you, your capital situation might di differ. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll chime in here as well with this. When you have a, when you put down, let's say you buy a house hack, you put 5% down, right? You're leveraging 20 to one. 
So every point of appreciation is worth 20% return on your uh, initial investment. If you bought that place with all cash, then that what one point of appreciation is, is a 1% return on your investment, right? So your returns, broadly speaking, begin to lessen on average over time on your, your total return on equity as you hold the property, as it appreciates, and as you pay that loan down. So as you deleverage, your overall returns are going down, but your cash flow is likely going up because your rents are going up and your expenses are, for your mortgage may be staying the same um, and that sort of thing. So it's what's that trade-off? For me, that's why I buy dollar cost averaging once every 12 to 18 months. I get a good blend of that high return for my property I just recently bought, but I'm also benefiting from the cash flow from those first few purchases that's kind of climbing and helping me out. Yeah, I have questions around um, your cash flow Scott, you want to take that one? Sure. So the question is uh, cash reserves. How much cash reserves do you have? And, you know, for, and how does that work with your scaling portfolio? So when I bought my first house hack, I spent my money to put the down payment. I had a few thousand left over, and I rapidly built up a reserve of about 15 grand. But bought the second property, I added 10 grand to that. So that's 25. Bought the third property, I added 10 grand to that, 35. Is that a mathematical, uh, you know, that I go in my spreadsheet and calculate how much? No, but I think that that's a, I think I'm likely to be able to sustain a number of problems, even if several happen at once across the portfolio with that amount of reserve. If I, you know, revisit and I'm like, mm, maybe I need a little bit more for that, um, I might. But I also have a cash reserve for my personal life, so I could always plot that <coughs> as well. I'll probably add another five or ten in at least. I um, actually heard this from Paula Pant, and I actually use it as well. Um, just like you, your personal life, many of you have an emergency fund of three to six months. Um, I look at it like with your rental portfolio, particularly when you're leveraged, you should probably do something similar. So, like if you have one property that rents for a thousand a month, having three thousand to six thousand uh, uh, saved is kind of a good rule of thumb. And it covers things like what if your property is vacant for three months, you're not getting any rent coming in. You can have three months of rent. It can cover, you typically want to be big enough to cover a heating and air that goes out and kind of the cash flow swings that you're going to experience. So for me, for example, that's, that formula scales. So if I have 90 units times a thousand, you know, whatever the number is, you can then still have three months of rent times, times that rent. And I, so I have a very large cash reserve and I think that's prudent. I think it's, I mentioned that earlier, I think it's a smart thing to do because the, the bigger you get with leverage, the more risk you're taking on of one thing leading to another and to another. So ca cash combined with a hard assets is, a, is kind of a smart one-two kind of uh, asset allocation, I think. Yeah, I would say any amount of cash that you think is fine, go ahead and double that number, and then you should be okay. <laughs> What type of property do you have? Is that apartment? Single family house? Okay. I mean, other people might, might have some perspectives on this too, but um, keeping your rent a little bit below full market value is actually a, can, can do that. You still want to raise rents over time, I think, but um, I, I've heard this isn't all my portfolio. I have very transient tenants because I'm a college student rental, but I also have some houses. And I heard, heard another landlord one time call uh, a name for a house that he liked to buy called, called them mousetrap houses. They were houses that like, trapped tenants in there for, in a good way. 
um, because he would he would have a, a lot of storage actually. So this is a, this is where it's interesting. He would always want to buy properties that had a two car garage or a basement where the tenant could stuff tons of stuff, and and so the more stuff they have, the harder it is to move, and the harder it is to find another place to put all their stuff. And he would have tenants stay a very long time. So I'm, I'm kind of working on that myself. But I, I found my single family houses with a lot of storage, actually, people stay a long yeah. time. And to add to that, um, so I used to have a property management company. And we had our average tenant stay with us for three and a half years. Some were one and done, and some stayed for as long as five, six, seven years. It is very much a people business. And as tenants, they want their needs to be addressed. So communication is very important. Valuing your tenants is very important and treating them how you want to be treated. Because if you're neglectful, you don't take care of repairs or you treat them poorly and without respect, why do they want to live there? But if they're happy and you treat them well, uh, they'll take good care of you and stay or, or more incentivized to stay longer. Yeah, so I had a tenant that uh, I, was inher I inherited him when I bought the building and uh, he had been there for five years at that point and I did everything I could to get him to stay. Um, the previous owner had given him a Christmas card the year before that said, Merry Christmas, your rent's going up $50. It can start in January, which I was like, wow, that's harsh. Um, so instead, I gave him a, uh, a Christmas card that said, Merry Christmas, your rent's going up $50. Just kidding, here's a $25 gift card to Aldi. Merry Christmas. Like, going that little bit ahead will make a huge difference. It was $25 to Aldi. Like, that's nothing to me, but that was everything to him. Okay, he's asking about contractors. Do you avoid a property that needs a fix? No, we all love those really awful houses. <laughs> yeah. uh, those are my favorite type of properties. Uh, the second house I bought was a complete gut renovation, uh, which included everything from new plumbing, new electrical, uh, floors, kitchen, bathrooms, you name it. Um, just like everything, uh, you can start with local meetups, find people that are doing what you're doing, make sure you get references and speak with the reference um, and see what their experience was like. Um, you know, contractors are kind of dime a dozen, uh, but not all of them should be hired. Yeah, you find a good contractor, you keep them no matter what. Um, and definitely don't hire a contractor off Craigslist because that's no, no bueno. Yeah. And Amen. Not that I uh, did that or anything. Yeah. Also, to add on to that, you probably get what you pay for. So sometimes the lowest, cheapest bid can turn out to be much more expensive uh, because you may have to revisit work. So uh, good contractors cost maybe more than the average. Yeah, the, the saying on bigger pockets is you think that a hundred dollar an hour contractor is expensive. Try hiring a ten dollar an hour contractor. <laughs> Let me confirm that for you. Don't hire them off of Craigslist. Uh, one of the best tips I ever heard was from Jay Scott. He's a flipper, um, and he said, I go to Home Depot at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I look at the contractors that are there before they start their job, picking up the supplies so they can do their whole job for the day. Um, I did not personally hire that guy. I hired the guy who went back at 10 because he forgot everything. Uh, you can talk to the guys behind the pro desk at the home improvement stores and ask them who would you do business with. And a lot of times they'll say, that guy. I will do business with Steve. Um, I, will, I would hire him to work on my mom's house. Steve. So the guys who work at Home Depot, and girls, I'm not sexist, the guys and girls who work at Home Depot can sometimes be a really great source of uh, contractors too. I'll give you one other source. Go, go to your local, if you have a realtor helping you buy properties or a property manager, they're going to typically have better sources because you, a lot of us might just be onesie twosie using this contractor or only using them one time and you don't have a lot of leverage on finding the best ones, but your property manager or realtor uses them over and over again with their clients. They're going to be a much better source of a contractor who has a relationship with your agent or property manager. And with that, once you find a good contractor, whether it's a plumber or an electrician, uh, the people working in this industry, they're constantly on job sites. So I've also found that, uh, actually through my plumber, I've found two other type of contractors uh, that are great to work with. Uh, so they're a good referral source usually. Kevin? Maybe be a little bit more aggressive. Any tips or ideas that someone could do? 
House hacking. Um, yeah, so the question is about getting to financial independence faster with real estate. It's, it's not a, it is more challenging, I think any wealth building's challenging when you're going faster, but real estate is a, as we talked about earlier, it's like a startup, it's entrepreneurial, so if you're gonna do it faster, you're gonna just have to understand that you're gonna spend a lot of time on it and buy more properties and be more aggressive. It also helps if you already have a big chunk of money to start off with. So if you're, if you're starting with a little small nest egg and you're trying to grow that bigger, I think three to five years is a little tough, unless you're gonna be very, very leveraged but if you already have a big chunk of money, I think you could, you could do it. Um, and then you, you might use some techniques. There's one technique that I really like to talk about called a debt snowball, which is just like very simple, you know, the personal finance, we use that for credit cards and things like that. But in real estate, you could use that and by buying a certain number of properties, kind of front loading them. So you buy 10 properties in one year or two years, and then you, you concentrate all of your cash flow and all of your savings on paying off one property at a time and kind of snowball, as each property gets paid off, you free up more cash flow and more cash flow. And it is a very nice kind of uh, path to get to a point where once you pay off a certain number of properties, you've now have a, you've increased your cash flow and you have a lot of income coming in and you can then live off that income. And so a debt snowball or some kind of, something you can work backwards and kind of predict your, your progress is something I would look at. And, and I'll, I'll chime in, I don't, the different perspective. If you're going to be entrepreneurial about it, then real estate can be a good thing, but you're going to put in a lot of work and maybe leverage very highly. I don't look at real estate as a three to five year major generator of wealth. I look at house hacking as a very effective first investment for the, the first amount of cash you might accumulate because you can leverage to such an extreme, but without actually taking on as much risk because you're, you know, you're, not, you're at least not taking more risk than the homeowner who's buying a home um, if you're house hacking and have tenants kind of contributing to the rent. So I think that there's a, like that's a good tactic to go in there that will help you in that those first few years. But then if you're looking to really build wealth through real estate and have sustainable cash flow, I think, I mean, most of the time, I think you're looking at a, a longer period of time, like five, seven, 10 years before you, before it begins to really kind of produce those exponential results. I don't know if that's at all fair for your that, that was my experience. My first five years were not, you know, it was, it was still building, so. But I did live off my real I did live, live off my real estate the first five years by flipping houses. So it was a business. So I, I think you the people who make a living off real estate really quickly have a combination of incomes. They might have a real estate license so they can make some agent fees, they might be a property manager, they might be a contractor. So I think you have to look at it like most people do have multiple sources of income so that your rental income isn't your only you're not depending just on that. Because the first five years you're still stabilizing and kind of getting things going. Well, and I think the more income you have from your real estate, the less money you need on the back end. Mm -hmm. I need a million dollars to retire so I can live off of $25,000 a year, but my real estate is bringing in $10,000 a year, then I don't need a million dollars. That number goes down as my cash flow goes up. So you can retire earlier because you don't need as much. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. <laughs> so I'm looking to buy my first flip. We have a rental, a rental property that was in a position of money, but how much of your time did you spend actually doing some of the repairs and going to the painting and building those? Because I actually wanted to do that. That's kind of what I do. It's going to be a good wall content for the one with the wall. But is, is it a good decision financially to try to do that? Okay, I'm going to take this question about how much work do you do on your flip yourself. Um, I have a hard time finding a good contractor. I can find a bad contractor like nobody else, but I have a hard time finding a good one. So I do it myself because it's not that hard. Um, at, when we first started doing that, we, I, I'm sorry, my husband and I do the work ourselves. There's some things that he does that I don't. Um, but it's not that hard. It takes uh, one extra tool. So now I have more tools in my you know, it takes me how long to paint a, a room? I'm going to live there anyway. I'm, we actually do most of the work ourselves because we're there, we're doing it, and finding a contractor is so hard. There is a raging debate about should you do it yourself or should you pay somebody because how much is your time worth? Well, at the time, my time was, I don't want to say not that valuable, but it wasn't that valuable. I could, I could take the time to 
paint and you know install the flooring myself because the guy who wanted to do it was going to cost so much more. Um, now I'm I'm leaning a little more towards paying people, but that's because my time is now more valuable. Um, I can't recommend any place in DC, so I'll let you. <laughs> um, for so are we looking for rental properties or for flips or uh, flip? You know uh, the city right now is uh, there's a lot of blooming neighborhoods. Um, you know. Eckington, Bloomingdale, um, Trinidad are great. Um, Randall Heights is blooming. Um, Deanwood has been deemed the hottest neighborhood for appreciation in the city. Um, so really, you can probably make a deal work in any neighborhood. It's just knowing um, what you're buying it for, what your renovation cost is gonna be, and what the after repair value is. Um, so it's provided that the numbers make sense and the fundamentals of the neighborhood are fine, you should be okay. Uh, she's asking, what do you decide to upgrade in a rental and what do you decide to leave as is? Uh, I went with um, whatever I was uncomfortable using myself, I upgraded it to a level where I was comfortable. I don't have the fanciest taste, so I'm cool with like laminate countertops and stuff like that. Um, I would go more for durable lastability rather than like quality per se. They're, they're interlinked, but they're, they're different. Um, so for tenants, like I had wood floors, original quarter sawn oak floors that I could have refinished, and I don't trust those tenants to ru not ruin them, so I put carpet over them. And it's, it's all about what is easiest to maintain with a revolving door of tenants. So with that, I think the neighborhood also plays a significant role. So while everyone may like granite countertops or high-end countertops, certain neighborhoods you may not get the rent appreciation for it. Likewise, if you have laminate countertops in an A-class neighborhood, you may have a hard time finding renters because they're expecting to have the higher end finishes. Mm -hmm. So you really need to know your neighborhood and the tenant base that you're trying to appeal for. But you also wanna make sure the renovations and the dollars that you're putting into the property are gonna be accretive to having the appropriate rents. Yeah, this is an area where I think I've actually done a poor job with my rentals where I have gone for the lasting durability, the most cost-effective long-term solution I can that provides utility. Uh, and my rentals are a little maybe higher end to the point where I could, in, the, in terms of location, where if I had done a better job thinking through that and had any artistic or creative or visual uh, <laughs> thought process putting behind it, which is not my strength, um, that I might be able to command higher rents for that. Um, so I just, I think that's a failure on my part. I just wanted to point out that <clears> these guys so it's just it's different for every neighborhood. Yeah, it's all about the neighborhood. I'm like Scott, and my creative uh, abilities, housewise, is not very good. Although I've rehabbed dozens of houses, so I've, I've used other people to help me out. You might be much more creative than I am. Our creative at knowing what your customer wants. That's the most important part. We can't give you a formula because you just have to know, like, look at open houses, go to your local neighborhood, see what people expect, and try to exceed that in some areas or at least meet it. But I, th I think they're, the, the durability thing for a landlord is very, very important, <clears throat> the maintenance. Like I actually look at houses, if, if I see a property that has wood siding on the outside and has lots of like things you're gonna have to paint every three to five years, that's a big negative for me. Like I, my ideal house would be like brick or like some kind of masonry on the outside with metal or vinyl, like all the trim around the windows and the outside. It would have like a really durable roof. It would have, and the roof would not have a lot of lines. It would just be like the box that, <laughs> that she was talking about earlier. A rectangle with a crawl space for me and, and having brick outside with wood, hardwood floors and tile floors inside. <clears throat> Think about those surfaces. You're not gonna have to change out carpet. You're not gonna have to paint the outside every once in a while. And that makes an enormous difference in your long-term cash flow based on having a low maintenance property. My house was three stories, and it had wood shingles, and it was beautiful. It was a historic home, and it also cost me $15,000 the first year to repaint it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>
Um, yeah, so I, I do a, well, you're talking about the market survey? Mm -hmm. So I, I do a study of markets all across the country. This is not the place to look for this. Uh, I, I just wanna, he, he was referencing an article, um, but it, it talks about what like historical appreciation rates have been in those, uh, in the 50 largest metros across the nation. Um, so, but the question is always, what's gonna do well over time? And so I think when you're looking for different markets, it's gotta be a combination of, will it cash flow? Is there a reasonable chance at appreciation? Because if we don't think the property is gonna go up in value, we shouldn't be investing in real estate um, at, some, at, at some level, right? Um, and then um, uh, what kind of network or boots in the ground can you put in place there? Right? I think that there is some power, again, you, you just, it's, it's what you, the word you used earlier was abdication. If you are just like, hey, I have no desire to ever visit this city at any point in my life, um, you totally abdicate all control and all influence over your investment selection versus if you're at least willing or able or have some sort of network on the ground um, or can trust some resources where you have some leverage in the relationship. Um, I think that those are all factors in selecting cities. So. Uh, I don't know if that, that's a very vague answer. So no, that's a good. Uh, I echo what he says, and also <clears throat> just specifically when I'm, I'm I'm investing locally, but I'm helping other people look at choose markets and something we look at is just big picture demographics. So you want to make sure the city has increasing population and good job growth. Those are so real estate goes up in value as a supply demand dynamic, and so most cities uh, most markets lag supply like it's hard to build new construction it takes a long time to, to build to go to the city and get permits and do all that so if you find a city where demand is going to increase meaning the population is increasing jobs are increasing you're, that's kind of the recipe for big picture appreciation so that's that you can look at the census you can look at uh, the census.gov you can look at a lot of other demographic websites to kind of see the big picture and then but once you get a city or a metropolitan area, area that looks good you then want to zoom in <clears throat> neighborhood by neighborhood. And you heard Drew like listing off neighborhoods in DC. That's the kind of knowledge you want. You want to know like this little area here is a really good area. That one's kind of up and coming. That one's not there yet. And so you can do that by getting on, you know, local Zillow groups, local bigger pockets would help. Um, just talking, going to your local real estate meetups, but also having an agent on the ground. Like, you know, agents know neighborhoods really well if they're experienced. And, and so you can leverage their knowledge of the local market to say, like, what are the locations that are up and coming? You use the A, B, C, D scale maybe to kind of to rate things. And I actually have Google Maps in my location where I'll have, like, make a Google Map where, like, this area is blue. Like, I'm not going there. This area is red. That's kind of a hot area. This is where I want to be and, and start farming and shopping, like, in those locations. Yeah, well, and I would just say that sometimes realtors won't tell you if it's not a great area either because... Uh. They're not, that was what I ran into. I was like, yeah, this is a great area. And he's like, I can't, I can't really say. And I was like, oh, okay. Cause you know, that, that's working against their interests. Right. And, uh, so that way you can find somebody who tells you don't buy South of that road, only buy North of that road. Cause I bought South and I should have bought North. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of, one of the other larger commentaries here is a lot of people in California and these expensive markets are thinking about, hey, the market's gonna, the market's peaking, it has to be peaking right now, right? Uh, I need to move my money out of my market and into a more stable investment somewhere else in the country. And this is, you know, and the, and the, and the philosophy behind it, this is exactly what I'm thinking about doing, right? Because I'm, I'm worried Denver is, is peaking, like, oh, you know, are we, are we hitting a market top? And I keep coming back to, it's, it's like, trying to time the market in reverse. You know, everyone gets afraid of the, the doubt, everything's selling at the downturn. You know, we have no idea what was gonna happen in the future of the markets. When I look at Denver growth, it's been the highest in the nation over the last four years, um, and really one of the highest in the nation since the, the, the bottom of the recession. Is it gonna go and crash in the next market recession? I don't know, but I, what I do know is that there's no supply being built. All of the new construction going on in Denver is in multifamily apartment building. There is some single family, but there's no, con millennials are way too good to do contract work. So they all have the, the college degrees and they're not going into construction trades. There's no supply of contractors. You know, our uh, fearless leader, Donald Trump, has increased tariffs on steel and aluminum and timber so that all the supply costs uh, for, for constructing these places are going up. You know, so if there's nothing being built and there's tons of people moving into my city, am I really, is it gonna peak? I don't know. So I, I think that there's a huge, I think that that's where I'm trying to get back to, like 
you know, for, the, for a big part of this year, I was like, I'm going to break my cycle of buying every 12 to 18 months in Denver. I'm going to buy elsewhere. But as I have been kind of revisiting my philosophy, I'm like, no, it's sound. Maybe it is peaking. But I will continue to buy in Denver because I don't know. And all signs continue to point towards who the heck knows what's going to happen in this market. I believe Denver is going to appreciate long term more than if I went to Indianapolis, for example, where I don't know anything about the city. Sorry if it is from Indianapolis. But I don't have a network there, and I don't know anything about this, that city's prospects. But I do believe in 30 years, my investments in Denver will be um, appreciate, more appreciative, appreciate more than an investment in a market um, in some other part of the, the country that I don't know nearly as well. So is that, I don't know if that's helpful commentary as well. Um, so we've gone over 25 minutes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> from our original 50 minutes allotment. Um, I'm going to call this now, but we're going to stick around for a few more minutes and answer questions if you have any. And then um, I tried to get this to go in a circle, but I don't know how to do that. So this is how you contact all of us. We're all really, really nice um, and would love to talk about real estate all day, every day. Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.